Welcome to another session from EpiCenter Evidence Tools, Products, and Projects. This series of brief webisodes will introduce the audience to several tools, products, and projects of the Evidence for Policy and Practice Information and Coordinating Center, or EpiCenter. Based at University College London's Institute of Education, the EpiCenter focuses on the development of systematic reviews and studies the use of research evidence. I'm Joanne Starks from the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or KTDRR, at American Institutes for Research. The Center on KTDRR is sponsoring these webisodes with support received from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, NIDLR, in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This session focuses on dimensions of difference in systematic reviews. Our presenter is David Goff, who is the director of the EpiCenter and is also a professor of evidence-informed policy and practice. David's interest includes the development of systematic reviews and the study of research use. Welcome, David. I will now hand things over to you. Thank you, Joanne. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how systematic reviews vary, what my colleagues and I call dimensions of difference in systematic reviews. So, first of all, what are systematic reviews? Well, they are reviews of research, and research is systematic critical inquiry. People do primary research out in the real world, and Research reviews are a meta level of research where you bring together the findings of already completed studies. Instead of addressing research questions by studying the world directly, reviews use the findings of existing studies to address research questions. As reviews are a form of research, they should be systematic and explicit about methods. Really, we shouldn't really need to use the word systematic um, the problem is that traditionally uh, reviews of literature weren't very rigorous or systematic, and so we now use the word systematic to be clear that these are research exercises. They are research processes for bringing together research findings. Now, in primary research, there's extreme variation in the type of research questions asked and the methods used. So you would expect, and it's true, that systematic reviews would reflect this variation. If you ask a question at the primary level, then you can ask a same question at the secondary level. You can ask a systematic review question that reflects the primary research. So if you ask a particular type of question, then the review is likely to include primary research studies asking the same question. But in addition, the methodology used in the reviews are likely to have similar methodological approaches as, and concerns as the primary studies that they include. So for example, if you are asking a question about the effect of an intervention, you will be concerned about bias leading you to come to the wrong conclusion. So your methodology will protect against bias. If you are concerned about understanding a process of phenomena, then you'd be considered concerned more about interpretation and representation. So the method of the review is likely to reflect not only type of studies included, but the philosophy of research method used. Now, in research, people often make a distinction between quantitative and qualitative research. And it's very easy for people to understand what that means, but we think that, my colleagues and I think, that the distinction falls down if you look at it in closely. So we prefer to make the distinction between aggregative research and configurative research. And aggregative research is where you add up things. You aggregate 
So in primary research, you try to aggregate things. And in systematic reviews of aggregative research, you aggregate the aggregations, as it were. It's all about trying to count things up to understand them. Whereas configuring um, primary research and configuring um, reviews, those approaches to analysis are looking for patterns. So if we look at the different research questions and methods that, are, that, are, that you might ask, um, I've already referred to the question of impact effectiveness, what works. And normally that is using statistics and counting up things. So that is predominantly a configurative, sorry, not configurative, that is predominantly an aggregative approach to research. However, there can be configurative aspects. So when you do a systematic review on the what works question, and you find the primary studies, and you look at their effect sizes, and you combine them, and come up with a combined aggregation, a combined effect size, that is an aggressive exercise, an aggressive analysis. But if you then go in and do regression, look for correlations in the studies, look for patterns to develop hypotheses about what may have, uh, what sub aspects of the data might reveal, that is a configuring exercise. You're looking for patterns. If your question is about causal processes and mechanisms, um, that may again be a configurative exercise. Um, because the whole approach it is about trying to understand how things relate to each to really relate to each other. But in doing a, a review, a primary study or a review on causal processes and mechanisms, there may be some aspects which are adding up data and some which is looking for patterns. You may have a mixed methods review. And in a, in a later slide, I will give an example of that, um, where you're combining things. So again, it's not quantum qual. It's about different approaches to analysis, whether you're aggregating data and whether you're configuring data and the degrees to which you're, you're doing that. And then the, the final example on this slide is prevalence. And prevalence is counting things up. So that is very clearly an aggressive exercise. So we just need to be aware that uh, the forms of analysis can be aggregative, configurative, or a balance between these. So if we have that in our mind, we can think about a range of ways in which reviews may vary. So the first thing is the review question. We've all researched the question is the rock, the starting point that then drives everything that you do. And you may have open questions. So that's where you are taking a more of an exploratory approach. You're not got a very closed view. You haven't got a very strong a priori, narrowly defined, specifically defined question. You're much more open and exploratory. So that is on the left-hand side of this graph. And an example of that would be a primary research or a review, which is trying to make conceptual claims, developing concepts, developing ideas, very configurative. On the right-hand side are more closed questions. So statistical meta-analysis asking questions like what works is testing a very specific hypothesis. I have the, this hypothesis that this intervention will have a different outcome to a controlled or a comparison intervention. It's hypothesis testing, so it's a very closed question. In the left-hand side, those open questions are about developing emerging, emergent concepts rather than the right-hand side, which pre-specified. Pre the open emergent approach will have methodology, but there will be more iteration there'll be less formalized procedures, whereas the closed pre-specified a priori questions are more likely to have tightly controlled formal methodology. 
I must emphasize, this is not suggesting that the open emergence approaches don't have methodology, methodological rules, and principles, and processes. It's that they, the extent that they are specified and allow iteration. And then again, that leads to different types of inferences, theoretical inferences or statistical inferences. And in terms of the results and how they're used, that can also lead to differences with um, the more open emergent ones developing theories and concepts is about enlightenment. Um, Carol Weiss developed this idea that uh, research is probably having more effect by changing the way we understand the world, an enlightenment effect, than the instrumental effect of facts and information um, providing us with more information. So what's really important in looking at these dimensions of difference is that in any particular bit of primary research or a review, quite often there'll be balances between these things or mixtures of these things. I've already given the example of post hoc regression analysis to explore and develop ideas in a what works statistical match analysis. That's just one example of how things can be can be mixed. But just to, to um, give a more concrete view, um, this is what's called a forest plot. So this is used in statistical match analysis to test what works questions. And this example, and it's a made up example, um, shows five studies. Um, and all those studies vary in their effect size. And they also vary um, in the how much confidence, the confidence intervals that they have. So in the graph, the, the squares, the black squares, is showing you where the effect size is against the uh, line along the bottom, the x, the x axis, one, two, to three. And the size of, of it gives some indication of the um, sample size and um, how big of a result it was. And then the lines are the confidence interval. So the studies with larger samples and uh, will tend to have more confidence in the results, and therefore the confidence intervals will be narrower. But the main point about this is that the bottom, the, the square, the diamond-shaped square um, with no filling, um, not black, shows the combination, the combination, the combined effect sizes in the statistical match analysis. So if you if you just followed the results of one study, you probably wouldn't get the correct result because you hadn't uh, taken into account the other research evidence on the same question. So this is a clear example of aggregation. The next example is a mixed methods review where there was a question about barriers and facilitators to fruit and vegetable intake amongst young children. So this was concerned about uh, trying to increase the fruit and vegetable that young children and young people ate. So there was two sub-questions, and uh, they took different approaches to, to, to uh, systematic reviews. So first of all, there was a broad mapping exercise. And there's another episode about what mapping is. But basically, it's describing a research field. And in this review, there was a very broad question, including very many different studies. And those studies could be used to both answer the, the sub-question about trials and the sub-question about views. Now, the sub-question about trials was asking whether public health interventions that were uh, used to try and encourage children and young people to eat more fruit and vegetables were effective. And then that was compared with um, a study on young people's views and understanding about health and eating. So the trials uh, systematic review, the what works, systematic review was predominantly one of aggregative synthesis, and the view studies 
was one of mostly of configuring synthesis, trying to look at what the children and young people understood about fruit and vegetable, and then trying to see patterns to create a thematic um, synthesis. Third example is a more complex question. And this question was asking about whether legislation to stop people smoking cigarettes in cars where children were present was likely to be effective. And so that question was unpacked. So it was seen as like a hypothesis, a theory of why would you expect banning smoking in cars to have a positive effect. So here, these list of one to four are some of the sub-questions that you would answer. And all of those are asking very different questions with different types of evidence. Toxicology, survey research, political science, um, evaluation of policing. So in this type of review, and this is an example of a realist synthesis, the first part of the review process was unpacking what the question meant with all these different sub-questions. And then each of those sub-questions were answered separately. So in an example two, there were just two sub-areas. But in this example, there are very many more sub-areas. And each of them will have different balances of aggregative research to answer the sub-question and configuring research to answer the sub-question. Um, but predominantly, unpacking the review question is a configurative exercise, and then going to find evidence in support of those different subcomponents is predominantly an aggregative exercise. So this shows how reviews are not just one thing. You have different questions, you need different methods. The questions may be simple or they may be complex. The methods may be single or they may be multi-component mixed methods. And this slide explains some of the further dimensions by which reviews may vary. So <clears throat> we've really covered the questions and conceptual framework, studies considered, and single or multi-component reviews. Um, but reviews will also vary in how much they try to address. Do they address a narrow question or a broad question? And to what detail do they examine those questions? So those um, multi-component reviews in the previous few slides, of course, are quite broad. But to what depth are they examining those issues? And that will depend on the resources available, time, staffing costs, and things like, like that. I've already mentioned that these can be balancing in the extent of aggregation and configuration. And therefore, also, they're going to vary in the extent that they're going, that they're going to be using, using existing theory, developing new theory, and exploring empirical data. So, the work done by review is not only determined by the question, but how it's addressed, how much resources there are. And not only can you um, have a systematic review, you can have a review of reviews, which is the higher level of analysis. So the idea that one review is one thing is not really true. It can be many things. Some people talk about rapid evidence assessments or rapid reviews. Now, as a systematic reviewer, I get anxious about whether it's a systematic rapid review. But if it's rapid, then you are reducing the time and resources available. And therefore, what you can achieve is likely to be less. In a way, something has to give. Now, that may be that the question is very narrow, or it may be that some of the methodological rigor will become a little, little weaker and shortcuts are taken. But it's 
you've got a set amount of resource, then that will affect the choices that you you make. You can do something broadly and shallowly, narrowly and in depth. If you have lots of resources, you can do all of these things. So finally, I want to say something about review brands, because in the literature on systematic reviews, there are lots of names describing different types of reviews. And these are very, very helpful as a shortcut label to understand the approach being undertaken by a review. But I would urge caution, because within these types of reviews, these brands of reviews, there may be quite a lot of variation, or there may be lack of specification about how the reviews vary on all of these dimensions that I briefly uh, discussed in this presentation. So the brand is helpful, but it's a quick label. It's not telling you the specifics. So if you're undertaking a review or you're reading and trying to understand a review, you really need to go beyond the brand and look at all these different dimensions of difference. So if you're interested in this, then this approach to considering reviews is throughout um, a book, a kind of textbook on systematic reviews that my colleagues and I at the EPI Center have produced, and that will explain this whole philosophy in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for sharing the EPICENTER perspective on dimensions of difference in systematic reviews. We also want to thank our funding agency, NIDLER, for supporting this and other webcast activities. Please look for the other sessions in this series on the EPICENTER evidence tools, products, and projects.